Awesome. All right, excellent. So it is my pleasure to introduce today uh, Landor Road Barbarigas, um, faculty in our department. Uh, he has been a faculty here at UM since 2015. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc at Princeton from, I believe, 2012 to 2014. Um, he worked on the form finding lab with Sigrid Adriansens, and before that, he got I think his bachelor's, master's, and PhD at EPFL in Switzerland. And for his PhD, he worked on tensegrity structures, which I believe he still works on that today. And in general, he's an expert on structural morphology problems. Okay, so today he's gonna. Tell us a little bit more about these tensegrity problems and, and how to, uh, I guess, apply it to science and engineering applications. So, uh, Landolf, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. I mean, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, pleasure always to participate on these uh, uh, seminars and uh, seeing also the spectrum of uh, presentations that we have. Today, I will be talking about basically tensegrity. This is a uh, Kind of the uh, the evolution of my work as a PhD student, so it's always important to see how things have evolved, what questions were raised as you actually do your research as a PhD student, and where it goes next. So uh, this is work that uh, uh, has been conducted here at the University of Miami, most of it. Uh, a key person there, Omar Aloui, my uh, ex PhD student and now postdoc at EPFL at the Laboratory of Robotics there, so at the uh, Swiss Center of Robotics. Uh, uh, very interesting work, very fundamental, and uh, I, I want to focus on the fundamental side of it to see how this is applicable to everybody in a certain extent. Uh, the same thing might seem like a, a, a how can I say, a odd word. Uh, it means tension and integrity. Uh, it might be a little bit uh, uh, strange for some of you, but it's nothing else than uh, uh, basically a, a subset of lattices. We're going to go through. Uh, the discussion there, but uh, for uh, structural people, you're going to find that this is a, another structural system, uh, maybe a, a, a little bit exotic. Uh, for uh, environmental people, think about basically this as a, a subset of uh, lattices. Uh, this goes also to material people like Luis and some of you uh, out there that have been focusing at uh, structures as that. So this is very fundamental work. Uh, it, people can find also uh, uh, applications in, uh, again, uh, metamaterials, in uh, morphing structures, in uh, aerospace, and so on. So let's, uh, let's start, though, by understanding a little bit where we're coming from. And uh, uh, in the sense of tensegrity being a STEAM concept, it actually started from art. There is Kenneth Snelson, who is a New York uh, uh, sculptor, who started putting together struts and cables and creating sculptures that looked a little bit chaotic. And although they look chaotic, they're definitely not chaotic. There's a straight, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, analysis and equilibrium that happens inside the structure to find that balance. So uh, Kenneth Nelson created those sculptures, but uh, the name got from uh, uh, this uh, man that I hope um, uh, you identify this book, Meister Fuller. So he's an architect, philosopher, engineer, I mean, a multidimensional personality. And uh, this is uh, to be said there because uh, he was the one who propelled it to the next dimension and uh, made it uh, more uh, popular. So uh, he, he was actually uh, the, uh, in, uh, he was working with Kenneth Nelson. Kenneth Nelson was his student. So he took the concept and elevated it to uh, uh, the next level. Uh, some people argue that this comes all the way from uh, constructivism. So there are some uh, uh, pictures of Russian constructivism and uh, Carl Jorgensen is an, art, uh, an artist there. And you can see there in the background, some structures that look like tensegrity. We don't know if this is, uh, if this was a tensegrity in the same way that uh, Kenneth Nelson was producing it. But you can definitely see uh, where this is going in terms of uh, the uh, parallelism between the art. And of course, once you got into the art, it naturally connected with architecture. So this is a structure, it's called the Blur Building. It was a temporary installation in a lake. So you can see that the entire structure there is kind of like a, a transparent uh, cloud. Actually, what they had there, they, were, uh, they had this uh, kind of uh, smoke around it. So you could walk in the cloud and be in a cloud inside a lake. So this is was for the Swiss Expo 02. Uh, for some odd region, 
uh, odd reason I, I didn't have the chance to visit it, but this is an emblematic structure. It's actually sitting uh, some of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the archive sitting at the, the Museum of Contemporary Art in New York. So it's a very uh, interesting structure. Of course, mathematicians also jumped in and mathematicians make idealizations and use the, uh, uh, the, uh, the concept. So you can see two parallels there. Uh, the other aspect of this, when it goes uh, to the large scale, people also see it in the uh, micro scale. So uh, they used uh, conservative grids for the uh, cytoskeletal mechanics. So Don Ingbert, we had a call, a talk from Ingbert a couple of years ago here at the University of Miami. Uh, so he has been investigating uh, or using conservative as a model for uh, cell mechanics. So there are important properties there that you can bring from the system. And uh, again, it, there is a, an interesting discussion there. So how this can go through scales and materiality, because of course the materials is gonna be uh, an important component of this. So once you create it. Now, the next part of this, of course, applications such as uh, uh, the NASA lander. So this is the Super Bowl bot, a project uh, that will run from the best lab at Berkeley, investigating uh, 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 structures that can uh, uh, be used for uh, uh, exploratory missions. So here you can see this uh, structure that was uh, designed to roll on a different planet. So uh, Basically, be compacted, deploy, land, and explore the planet uh, with different uh, measurements. So here, this is just the skeleton. Uh, it's interesting to see the uh, the uh, uh, let's say different ideas there, and I can show you kind of uh, my uh, work there uh, at the PhD level, which resulted basically in the design of this structure. So this is kind of like. A, uh, uh, I was the uh, first designer on this structure, so I put the uh, structure together and I made it work. And people then, of course, uh, made it work better. So uh, kudos to the team there. So what you see here is basically an active deployable trajectory structure. So it uh, unfolds from both sides, uh, meets in the middle, autocorrect its position. So then you have an, a live uh, feedback and an active control system with sensors and actuators. So uh, the structure is putting together, now it joins and then it corrects itself, finds the right position, and then of course it unfolds. So this goes towards uh, uh, kinetic architecture, smart structures, and uh, you can see the parallel with uh, the robotics there. You can see also a little bit the artistic component in the sense of uh, how is this designed. Of course, again, uh, multiple components there, and I would argue that this is uh, uh, a very interesting work that uh, spans beyond the uh, um, uh, traditional, let's say, structural engineering. Now, let's talk a little bit about what exactly we mean by the security. Uh, all right. In art, is basically a sculpture. It's a system, uh, a sculpture, an object, let's say, or an artifact made of struts and cables. String is, uh, uh, they call it uh, strings and sticks. Uh, in mathematics, it's all about self-stress frameworks. It's basically idealized uh, nodes and edges together uh, with some of their properties and it gives you equilibrium. In engineering, René Moutreau gave a more uh, uh, well-defined definition. He talks about the system in a stable, self-equilibrated state. So directly you see some properties there. First of all, it's a system, we have components. And there we have components that are uh, described as a discontinu discontinuous set of compressed components inside a continuum from tension components. So you have tension and compression. So directly we, uh, uh, we uh, identify the cables and the struts. And then we have the position and the continuity between them being discussed. Now there is a lot of discussion about that continuity. So uh, uh, compressive elements touching or not touching themselves. Uh, even more true there, he means by that the elements can, can be more than one uh, strut. So there is uh, this discussion and this opening. But the key property there is this property of a stable self equilibrium. Uh, and uh, by stable, it means that it goes back to that state if it is being disrupted. And self equilibrium means that it's stable by itself. Think of it as a, as a pneumatic structure, as a soccer ball. So uh, you inflate the soccer ball, and what do you have on the outside? You have the stretched uh, fabric or uh, the, uh, uh, the leather there that is in tension, and inside you have the compression. It's kind of like the same thing with pre stress of the uh, cables. 
Uh, now, uh, what happened there uh, is that uh, from an engineering perspective, that offers a lot of advantages or nice features. So this is mechanically and materially efficient. Why? Because you only have tension compression. You don't have any bending. You don't have any torsion. And this relates also to the way it's put together in the sense that we're talking about hinges and articulations and so on. This is statically indeterminate systems. Uh, somebody might say that this is complex, but for us, that means robustness because we have multiple load paths. You have kinematically... Uh, they can be kinematically determined or indeterminate. This relates to the mechanisms uh, that are included, and this is something we're going to discuss. And mechanism might sound a little bit odd as a word, uh, or uh, the analysis might sound a little bit odd for civil people who are focused basically on static applications. But the mechanism is a very important component of this, because even by just wanting to pre-stress a structure, if you activate the mechanism, all you're going to do is actually move that structure. And I know we have some people here in the audience that are focusing on that. And then you have instantaneously changeable or unchangeable systems. So this relates to basically how the stiffness which you provide when you move is activated or not activated. On the other side, they're called shape active and form found structures. So shape active because they can react to the, uh, to the, uh, to the loading and form found because of the way they are designed. So uh, if we want to understand form finding is basically this exercise where you get basic uh, elements so strands and strings and you want to put them together and if you do that exercise first of all the first time you do it it's a it's a little bit of a, 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 how can I say an inner exercise of patience to find the right way to put them together but it's also uh, a nice exercise of understanding the equilibrium so once you go through that this is an exercise that we call form finding and it's a process of identifying the stable again equilibrium self-equilibrium under a specific set of uh, configure uh, under a specific set of nodes and uh, links, so in the sense of a configuration. So think of it as you are defining a topology and a connectivity. So where the nodes are, how they are connected, and then you're you're looking to find a pre-stress self-equilibrium that is going to be stable. And uh, this is a, a very interesting, uh, let's say. Uh, exercise and it's key on many structures shell structures are def I defined like this like grid shells are defined like this but here directly i think you should be able to see that we have a starting point and that starting point is that we need to define a topology we need to define basically uh, that initial geometry so topology is basically finding the connectivity pattern between the nodes and geometry is about where the nodes are. So this is the, the words that we're using. So that topology finding is a very hard problem. Actually, mathematicians have focused on that and engineers and I would say uh, architects and engineers have focused on finding the geometry. So there's a disconnect between the two words. Uh, and uh, that is also a problem that we're facing right now. Now, uh, if we talk about the property of self-equilibrium, very uh, fundamental, and uh, uh, you can describe it basically by A omega equals F, with F being the external loads, A is the equilibrium matrix, and uh, the self-stress is basically the omega when you have A times omega equals zero. So that, of course, corresponds, I mean, mathematically, a little bit of linear algebra there to the null space of A, and this gives you basically a linear combination uh, every solution is going to be a linear combination of your null space. This is very important for us because it's allow us to understand fundamentally what is happening in the system. Now, with respect to uh, the uh, mechanisms, this is the other part of this. So how many, how is the equilibrium? How many equilibrium states do I have? And the other side of this is how many mechanisms? Do I have any mechanisms? Is it completely rigid or not? So we can actually study that by uh, the rigidity uh, analysis and this is what we have been doing and this you can think of it as uh, the uh, equiprojectivity of infinitesimal displacement so going back to that parallel between number of states of equilibrium and number of mechanisms that we have so in the mechanism we have to make a distinction between finite mechanisms which is basically the entire thing moving the infinitesimal mechanisms are very small mechanisms so think of it as negligible deformation in the elements. So a mechanism with negligible deformation of the elements means that basically I can have a direction where this, the uh, rigidity in that direction is reduced. 
And once you reduce the deformation, you can think about, oh, if I need, I need less energy to activate that. So that in some applications could be something very interesting. But in our application as the pre-stressing of a structure, this could be a challenge because basically all you're doing is moving again, a structure rather than actually uh, pre-stressing it. So there are, however, mechanisms that by increasing the pre-stress or regulating the pre-stress, you can control them. And these are very interesting for us. But the key that I want to, uh, the question or the statement that I want to make is while we know how to identify how many social states we have or how many mechanisms we have and what type they might be, we don't know why they exist there. How did, I mean, why in a certain configuration we have X amount and what they represent. So it's not always a, a, straight, uh, a straight answer for this. So this is how, uh, we have been working on this, and this is the type of questions we have been trying to answer. And of course, what I'm showing you here relates very fundamental mechanics in the sense of how many social states and how many mechanisms. And this relates back to uh, basically the equilibrium matrix or the uh, rigidity matrix and how this relates to fundamental theory of linear algebra. And these are basically linked properties. Now, the key for me, if I want to let you something about this evolution of uh, research is basically the problems that we're facing are the following. People have been focusing on topology and then people have been focusing on form finding. But this, let's say, schism between these two have basically uh, brought the research kind of uh, in silos and has not allowed us to develop structures for specific applications. So people choose a topology and work with it or choose a geometry that they like and go with it, which means that it's not necessarily the right one for the right application. So the system, the safety is a system, is a concept, is not one object. Now, the other aspect of this, which I've just mentioned is that we have methods to characterize, but not necessarily uh, understand and also uh, not necessarily uh, linked with the physical interpretation uh, of uh, what they represent. And of course, if you go into CVD, like I did some time ago, and you start working on this and you want to design, there are no design guidelines. Although it's just string and sticks, so you can think of it as, oh, it's just a truss cable structure. Uh, well, it's just straight, it's self-stressable. There are some complexities there, the mechanisms, how do you treat them? Uh, of course, you have two limit, uh, two uh, failure states there. So. Uh, although it seems very, uh, I would say, basic, uh, something very simple is not necessarily as simple as it looks. Now, what we worked on is inspired by uh, biology, and we call it cellular morphogenesis. And uh, morphogenesis relates basically to the way material is organized uh, in, the, in the formation of uh, cells to tissue, to organs, and the overall anatomy. And for us, cellular morphogenesis is basically a framework, a computational framework, where uh, we have elementary units, what we call the disability cells in an analogy, to create larger and more complex systems. So this is founded based on the work of maybe the most famous mathematician, the Spanish mathematician called De Guzman. He passed away uh, uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, so he published this work in a, in a journal where uh, the editor was a friend of him. And uh, he mathematically proved that every disability structure is made of those cells. So this is uh, what is stated the theorem and uh, David Orden, who is co-authoring that paper and now a professor in mathematics in uh, Alcala uh, has been working with us. Uh, but uh, the key outcome of this is basically that all the circuits are made out of the same elementary units. So that is by default, a very powerful statement. And the next thing that we uh, did is characterize those units. So these are infinitesimal rigid, so no mechanism, and they have only one cell state, which means one uh, equilibrium. So once you start with this, you can actually use them as Legos to build uh, all the other systems. But of course, the way you put your bricks has a, a big uh, influence on the properties you're getting. So what we did was we started through 
mathematics. So we went and understand the mathematics and then project that into structure. So we started understanding what is uh, that upper part. So this is the two dimensional cell. So what the upper layer, the upper figure there represents the mapping. And then what is the implementation if you actually use it in structures? These are the two, uh, let's say, trust systems that you're getting. And we also try to have a parametric description of the equilibrium in those structures. So uh, a little bit of math there. So we have this expression there, which depends on the geometry and the topology. This uh, V function there is related to the uh, areas that you use. And because this is related to the areas and you can see basically the nodes that are involved and the location of the nodes, we actually have a direct link between topology and geometry which in other method is lacking. So this is the first implementation of both. So you start seeing that we try to put, to put together the pieces of the puzzle when it comes to this. So having a parametric dis, uh, description is very powerful because then this is applicable and then you can start for, uh, exploring the design space. Of course, the way you combine things is very important. So in there also inspired by uh, the work in biology, we came up with uh, the two ways we could combine in cell adhesion and cell fusion. Adhesion is where the cells are actually working together, sharing a common edge, but they are still individual cells. So they have their own properties. And fusion is where they actually fuse. They become one cell with uh, basically uh, uh, the equilibrium being dissociated, diluted into the system if you want. So what we were able to do is throughout that process of putting cells together, uh, we were able to follow mathematically what happens to the equilibrium. So how many social states do I have? How, in, if you wanna talk in simple words, the degree of indeterminacy that we're having in the structure. So follow that while we create a structure or if we analyze a structure, do the same thing. So this is a key because then we know what to look for. So, or how many equilibrium should we get when we're doing our analysis? So we were able to describe not only the number, but provide a basis for that space of the equilibrium. So this is a key result for us, because if you want to design eventually something, you need to be able to design it by exploring the space, because the solution you might want might not be uh, on one part of the design space, but could be a specific neighborhood in that design space. So understanding in a very fundamental way uh, the uh, unit directors of your space and the basis that describe your space is, is a key result there. So to make things simple, I'll give you a, a quick example based on four modules. So you have this X module there. So what you have here is basically the geometry. So the nodal positions, the connectivity, and this is basically the, the force density, which is just the force divided by the length. So you can see some elements are in tension, some elements are in compression. When you are the second one, and they share a common edge. This is, of course, the geometry and the connectivity, which increases. But what you see here in this W matrix, you can see that this is the, the first column corresponds to the first cell. The second column corresponds to the second cell. What I want you to observe is that they share one common edge. So you see the one that is that on that second row. And you can see the other elements being zero. So that directly gives us that I have two equilibrium states, one for the first cell, one for the second. You are the third one. Same thing happens. You can see clearly that the third one came in and there is a common edge with uh, the first one. And once you put the fourth one, there's something weird happening. If you do the analysis and you follow, you see that the dimension goes to five. Actually, this W goes from three when you have three cells, because you're forming a circle, it goes directly to five. The, fifth, the fourth one is the cell that we input there. The fifth one is actually an interaction of the cell. So there is a, a, a cell that is created by pieces of the other cell. So an, in, a, an inner space there. So uh, this is what is highlighted here. So a subset there. So it, uh, it's an interesting result, but to have a complete dis description of that space, you need to understand, first you need to quantify that this exists and then you need to understand what that means. And what is interesting about the formulation that we provide is you see all that sparse matrix and the ones there, there's a direct link of, oh, that is participating. So you can clearly identify the subset on your structure where this happens. 
And then of course, when you put that together in the framework and then computational analysis, you create basically a method to generate and put things together. So eventually you can design something just by putting things together and having a description of your system. Now, in uh, a result, I talk about soccer ball. I know we have soccer fans here, including myself. So what I wanna say here is by using this, you can design soccer balls with different cells or states and different cells. So they might look a little bit uh, similar, but they're not the same. One has a degree of indeterminacy of 21. The other one has a degree of indeterminacy of three. So if you want, one can incur a lot more damage than the other one, but the complexity also is something else. So in some applications that might be a good thing, some uh, in other applications might be something we don't wanna have. What I'm trying to show you there is the flexibility of creating something, a, a fundamental framework which addresses that. Now, and a side effect of this is that we start understanding how the security structures work. So going back to that system there, what we actually realized and what I mentioned before is that you have five substructures. So four cells, but in reality, five cells of states which correspond to five structures. And of course there is a, a level of overlap between them. But if the structure is made out of five, let's say units, all I have to do in order to identify what is the state there is put five sensors on five unique locations in the sense of no overlap between those to identify what would be the uh, corresponding social state. So by doing that, we can basically identify what is happening to the structure. Again, you have a very, uh, let's say a fundamental question here. How many sensors do I need? But of course, this is the, a uh, basic answer to the very fundamental question of under cell stress only when I know the geometry, when I know what is happening there. So what we provide here as a first result was that you don't need to do the analysis. All you need to, to know is how many cells do your structure is made of. And then you just identify the cells based again with that matrix, which is a sperm matrix and has a direct link between the elements. So you can identify where do I place my sensors? The other output of this, which is very interesting, is uh, under different load cases, uh, this will allow us to uh, actually monitor the structure in a, in a way because this cell structure is not going to change if we change the load case. It's always going to be the same. So you can actually find that, okay, well, this makes sense, and I can identify what happens under load cases. But as the complexity increases, this is the baseline for the very theoretical first I would say question about the monitoring of these structures. So we worked uh, on this and we kind of find uh, found that answer. But in existing structures, you need a way to assess how many cells you have. And this is not a straightforward answer. Actually, uh, the mathematicians there worked on this, provided us with an algorithm, but that algorithm, the mathematicians did not care about the, uh, the number of uh, 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 units, cells they were getting. But for us in our world, we care about how many sensors do I put them, uh, where I put them and how many they are. So it's very important to find exact, the exact amount and identifying the locations. So we work with the, uh, with the mathematicians to develop basically a, a post-treatment routine, which gives us the minimal number and identifies it for each cell. So this is uh, a side note to uh, the work that uh, we did. Now, on the other side of this is also the mechanism creation. So you're putting things together and sometimes we all know that if you don't put them the right way, you might basically create structures that are not stable in the sense that they can move. This can be a problem or an advantage in some applications. So what we realized, of course, when you put adhesion being uh, putting cells together, uh, if you put them in, uh, in less than 10 uh, than two nodes in plane, of course, you're connecting something that can rotate. So this is a finite mechanism. Uh, in uh, fusion, where we put the cells and we actually create one equilibrium state for multiple units, then what happens is, uh, what uh, happens is there will be a creation of a mechanism when you obtain what the mathematicians call a degenerate position. Now, degeneracy is a key word in mathematics, which uh, it's really, uh, I would say, uh, a headache for engineers. And I will explain you more about it in the sense that 
it is actually something that we love in engineering is uh, degeneracy describes the uh, simplification or the restriction of a system to a lower dimension. So think about, I have all my nodes. Well, if my nodes are in the same line, then basically I have degeneracy because I can describe them only with uh, uh, one line rather than having positions in space. So if they satisfy a specific mathematical relationship, basically it is simpler to describe them, but on the same time, this brings other, let's say, complexities to the system. Now, when this comes, this is a key word in mathematics in the sense that the research that is being conducted in degeneracy is actually active research. Nobody has answered the, uh, I mean, identifying degeneracy is an open problem in mathematics and it's a hard problem in mathematics. Now, the key though for us is that by understanding that degeneracy is, a, is the, the problem, we actually can say that, okay, we can link the mechanical behavior to degeneracy, which is reflected by geometry and topology. So then we make the link also, not only for the equilibrium, but also on the mechanism side. And of course, this is something just to highlight you in, in a simple example, what we mean by that. So you have those two cells, you put them together, you create basically uh, a structure and you remove one element. So the structure is still being a, a, a statically indeterminate structure. The structure stays there, there's no need. But if now you remove two cables that share, so that node B there, you see that directly, that node E has to move in order to abound to the equilibrium. So what happens is it cannot stay there and be in equilibrium unless you can actually interfere and, and put struct, I mean, uh, and put, let's say, force in, inside there. So if you can act on the structure, you can maintain the form. But if the form is, uh, if you cannot act on the structure, then the form has to change to abound to the equilibrium conditions. So this is a, a very interesting result, which explains what happens in a lot of those structures. So what we were able to see here, this is basically, we were able for small structures and very, uh, I would say, easy to calculate uh, structures. We were able to uh, analytically describe that uh, uh, mechanism creation. So here the mechanism is basically the vertical direction on that uh, uh, alignment. And we were able to find a description, a mathematical description of the degeneracy and link it to the rigidity matrix. So this is what I'm gonna show you there. So this is the rigidity matrix of the system. And what we came up is that determinant of RF, so being that subset for that, uh, uh, when, uh, of that matrix, so that determinant of RF equals zero is the condition for that uh, mechanism to create, to be created. So this is an interesting result, but of course, when you have a system and this is happening, this, you cannot go and do this, it becomes chaotic. So, however, being able to, if you're conducting a, a construction cell by cell, you can narrow your search to specific nodes. So you can follow and kind of put rules there for when, it, when you should search and when that might occur. So instead of looking at the entire space, you kind of focus your search around this. So it's an interesting mathematical and I would say, uh, mechanical result that uh, we're currently exploring further. Now, of course, we worked on 2D structures, but we went also in 3D. And this is the example of the triplex. The triplex is the, uh, 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 the, the system with the uh, lowest number of elements that you can get to create a three-dimensional structure, a three-dimensional disabled structure. So you have that unit uh, number one, cell number one, cell number two, you put them together, you remove two elements, and this uh, uh, structure occurs, it has one Celsius state. And what I'm showing you here is basically the dimen the uh, direction of the mechanisms and the surfaces that you see there are the equilibrium surfaces. So you can move the nodes on those surfaces, the structure will be stable. And those arrows, which are perpendicular to the surfaces correspond to the mechanism that is being uh, induced. So we explain why the mechanism exists, why the equilibrium exists, and we can characterize them. And this is the first time that really this happened in this uh, uh, field of the security structures. Now, again, the idea behind it is while we're doing this for small structures, this will enable us to design large structures where we can direct the properties. 
And of course, when we want to design large structures, you have to put yourself out there and kind of uh, test yourself. So we tested ourselves with the Stanford binding, which is uh, uh, a benchmark problem in uh, computer science. So you polygonize that. We take the nodes, the connectivity, and we try to be, find a security structure that looks like the Stanford Barney. So this is what you have here. So here is with disconnected compressive elements. But of course, we also did uh, a high fidelity with a lot of more uh, nodes, edges, and cells. And of course, you can see here, we, here we actually combine them in a way that we don't have any uh, mechanisms created. Now, this is very interesting, but I want to give you uh, another video, finish with uh, the link back to, uh, let's say, installations and the real implementation of that. This is a project we did earlier this year. So it was in the making uh, uh, before the pandemic, then the pandemic hit. And then uh, uh, what this project is, is an artistic installation for a luxury brand. And uh, the uh, the structure became the, uh, uh, the artifact or their launching for a, a new watch. And this is actually the uh, the uh, assembly of the element, the construction of the, the circuit system. So uh, you see that uh, this is a uh, eight meter tall and a 10 meter wide structure. So think about it, uh, let's say 25 uh, feet and uh, 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 approximately nine to 10 feet uh, wide. The design was such that we have a mechanism that we can actually fold the structure afterwards. So we assemble it, we basically fold it, we transport it to the side, and then we basically unfold and uh, uh, we put the pre-stress there once we stabilize and uh, we control the mechanism. So this is the engineering version of it, but uh, the real outcome of this was this structure. And I'm gonna show you this video and end with this video so uh, this is this became the uh, this became the main artifact for this private exposition from Hermes. So it was at the center of that, and uh, I can probably report that I was the engineer behind, in the sense working with the artist, the architect there to put this together. So I did the morphological analysis, the sizing, and then uh, we worked with some engineers in place. Unfortunately, I couldn't visit there, but. Uh, The artist's idea was to have an endless column. Looks chaotic, but he's talking about the analogy with time being endless and uh, goes to infinity. See also the joints. We worked a lot on the joints to make them also look very polished. And uh, uh, you can, uh, I think you can understand and appreciate the work there from all parties. So uh, I give kudos to my team for the design there. Afterwards, is finished this. So again, I want to bring back to you this. So this is kind of uh, Omar's work and Omar's publications so of this. So very fundamental work, but I think it's a powerful tool. Uh, intersection maybe with uh, mathematics. Now we work more on what this means for the mechanic side. But I think there's a, a something to be said about how we design those systems and how they can be used across scale, across materials, and how it can be done to model from cells, to metamaterials, to foam, previously, uh, I mean, lattices have been used for that, and uh, to space structures, to artifacts, and so on. So uh, again, this is kind of like my pet project, and I'm excited always to talk about this. So uh, please uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions or comments about it.